Okay. AES, welcome. Um, AES New York this year is, as everybody by now knows, is not going to have a live conference. Um, but never let it be said that the AES is never forward looking. In fact, they're always forward looking. And so a virtual conference is what we're going to have. Um, we've been really fortunate to be asked to try to uh, host a panel on what we for lack of a name called the e-studio, but I believe it's really where things have been going for a number of years, as I think our panelists will prove to us. Uh, sometimes this, the, the studio of today is called the project studio or the home studio. Um, I just call it a studio. Um, and um, we've put together an interesting panel of people to discuss this subject. Okay. Um, let me, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, so that we get some eye candy up here. Um, you know what, let me just introduce everybody while, while we're all here. Um, from the oldest to the youngest. Well, I'll start with the oldest. Bob Margoloff, a wave. I don't have to introduce Bob Margoloff. Grammy award-winning engineer, producer, Stevie Wonder, Devo. And you can read all about him. Everybody knows who Bobby is. Still with us, 80 years old, my dear friend for over 50 years. Uh, my daughter's godfather and um, it is amazing that he keeps reinventing himself and you're gonna hear about some of his reinventions. Let's see if I can get the age right. I don't know, could be you, Pete, I don't know. Well, I think it's Clay, I don't know. Anyway, Clay Chef is the owner of Smash Studios, um, which is starts out as a rehearsal studio in New York. It's one of the biggest and has, oh, what a surprise, morphed into a complex complex of recording studios, podcast studios, rehearsal studios, and we're gonna hear his story, uh, a new friend in my life, but equally um, as, as important. Um, Pete Hoffman is one of the principals of Maloco from England. Thank you for being with us. By the way, it's about three o'clock in the afternoon Eastern. I won't tell you what day it is. And Bob is in California. Uh, Clay is in his studio in New York. Pete is in London. Thank you for staying up. Um, uh, Pete and I have known each other for about five years. We built Paul Epworth's studio, the church together in England. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to, to know Pete and watch his success. Maloco probably manages more studios than, than any other organization in the world. And um, Pete has um, extraordinary insight in what today's engineers and producers are really wanting in studios, particularly in the London area. Sam does, well, I don't think you own a studio, is relatively new in my life, but is an editor and writer for Sound on Sound, and that's not new in my life, and that should actually not be new in anybody's life. Um, and um, nice to have you with us. Um, and we're all anxious to hear what you have to say about this since you get to editorialize about studios all the time. Last but certainly not least, PK Pandy, very close friend and dear friend, systems integrator, an amazing guitar player, inventor, studio owner, and now a new type of studio owner, uh, almost the co-inventor of GC Pro. So certainly a multidisciplinary person. And he's in, normally in Boston, but I think you're in Miami, right? Yeah, you're in Miami. Yes, today. correct. Right, yes. and you'll see why he's in Miami. So that's our panelists. Um, the other logo there is Sergio Mojo, who's basically acting as ringleader and recordist and my dear partner also in Miami. Those are our panelists. I'm now going to share my screen, which uh, Serge just yell out if this is working. I think it's working. Give me two seconds to go into presentation mode and I think it should work. Um, Serge, I think that's good. All good. Great. Okay. So these are these are our panelists. I just introduced you to them. Okay. As far as the project studio is concerned, I'm, I'm really lucky because 50 years of designing studios, um, my first studio was a project studio. So I had the, of course it was built to commercial specs. It was famous before it was built and it's still in existence 50 years later. So I was really, really lucky because I had no idea I was building a project studio. Thank you, Jimmy, who unfortunately didn't get to be with us very long. Um, and, and so for me, I've always been doing project studios, big, small, commercial, non-commercial, code compliant, non-code compliant. They're in homes, they're in buildings. To me, it's never made a difference. I'm an architect and a musician. 
by training and uh, a technologist by acquisition. So for me, it was very, very fortunate. A quick tour, and this is just to get us in the mood. I'm not even gonna talk about these studios. These are today's studios and they come in all sizes and shapes. Okay, yes, this is a recording studio. Okay, and this is just to get us in the mood and to definitely prove to ourselves that there are no longer any boundaries. Our panelists are gonna, are gonna second that, okay? Um, glass is not our enemy anymore. It never really was our enemy. Um, Hollywood, churches have studios and here somebody bought a church because it was going out of business. Fantastic uh, sound in the original worship space. Uh, rural studios, this is in rural upstate New York. Okay. East Hampton, Eastern Long Island, Grammy Award winning Cynthia Daniels, her addition to her house. Um, I always like looking at this because that's my wife in the lower right hand corner there on the right. That's Beth. Hello, Beth. A garage studio, literally in a garage on the right. Beautiful home in Brazil um, for celebrity artists. And you can start to see that the line between homes and residences and commercial studios, the, the, these have been disappearing for a long time. Um, we throw this up right now, but certainly Pete's going to be smiling. This is the upper floor of, of Paul, Paul Epworth's studio at the church, which was the Eurythmic studio. And this is an all-in-one studio. So the control room, the live room boundary has disappeared in many, many instances. Um, why not? Why not take advantage of this incredible space? Pete built this. Thank you, Pete, for giving us this studio. A log cabin studio, why? Because that's where this artist lives. Pretty well-known artist whose name we, we just will skip right here. BK worked on this project. And below this log cabin in the basement is, I guess, our first log cabin studio. I'm not even quite sure what that means, but okay. Anyway, that's just to get us in the mood. Um, let me stop sharing for a minute. And there we go. Um, I got to just undo this one second. Sergio will edit that out for us. I'm going to reintroduce Bob Margloff in Los Angeles. Bob, you can unmute your mic so we hear you. Um, you have to unmute your mic. There you go. Thank you for being with us, dear friend. You're in Hollywood. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. We all know what you've done. But let's, what have you been doing in the last few years? Well, uh, the studios have gotten smaller and the music has gotten bigger. I think that the, uh, the technology has uh, certainly been uh, driving the art in a lot of ways. We don't, at least for me, I just don't exist as a studio owner or sort of compartmentalize, uh, uh, compartmentalize, uh, that was a long word. Um, uh, we're gonna make a decision or not. I, I don't think we're gonna edit that out. We're gonna let the people okay. see that you're very good on music, not too good on speaking, right? Yeah. But I, I think that, uh, you know, we all tend to, I think, uh, sort of uh, live in our own space uh, the reality is that uh, the technology really does drive the art forward. And I think that uh, the art of me making music has changed drastically over the last 50 years. Just for the record, Bob and I have been debating that for a long time. I actually think artists drive the studio business, but Bob, Bob and I differ on that. But I respect Bob's opinion and you... You I think you've been on the cutting edge of it, that's for sure. Well, I, I think that uh, music, for example, has become very much more uh, personal and confessional. Uh, a lot of music that we do now ends up being delivered on headphones. And uh, because of that, I think, and we use a lot of headphones even in the studio, especially now that we don't have any glass yeah. in between the acoustic space and the uh, recording of the control room. I think that we... Uh, we tend to use headphones a lot. So Bobby, in, Bobby, our history starts at, uh, with, with uh, Stevie moving to California and building a quad room for Stevie in an era when quad wasn't even delivered. Well, it starts, really starts earlier than that. Earlier, but that's okay. But it really started for me when I met John, and that was uh, at Electric Lady. 
uh, although I knew him by uh, uh, by not by name because he had a a, a a club he designed downtown New York on the east side, and uh, his, he designed the room, and I was so impressed with it. I didn't realize that two years later I'd meet John in person, and yes, indeed, it was the first home studio. Electric Ladyland was for me. Was a project a, uh, studio. Yeah, it was a project. It was the first ever project studio, and unfortunately, Jimmy had passed, and uh, I brought Stevie there from Media, which was a commercial studio on 57th Street. Uh, we made, you know, television commercials during the day, and Stevie came in at night. It became impossible. Bob, to keep, to keep this on track, because uh, you've been yeah. very I just, to say, I just wanted to say that going to Electric Lady yeah. was like putting my foot in a shoe that had already been made because Steve was able to uh, get there and to be super creative in the space. It was well beyond the pencil protectors and white shirt kind of studios that we had with the gray hammer tone and the funny little ceiling tiles with the holes drilled in them and fluorescent lights that we had at the time. This was uh, really a showstopper. And uh, it really uh, unlocked Stevie's creativity. And I want to fast forward, Bob, I, because you've, been, you've introduced a number of unusual notions for studio. So let's fast forward to an era when, for me, this was the first time I really saw you almost as a studio creator, because I knew you as a producer, okay? Um, when you identified the need, and it only lasted for a few years because there was a short window when we had DVDs, you realized that DVDs in, in the home could not just be direct copies of the of stems coming from the film theaters because of the sound and you created Mikasa Studios. Can you take us through this a little bit? Yeah, well, this uh, Mikasa was, uh, I would think, it, the king size home studio. I had three studios in the former home of Bella Lugosi in Outpost Estates. You can see the picture of there it. There it is, right there. There are the studios. And we had three, I built three home theaters, one in the dining room, one in the living room, and one in a bedroom. They all had uh, high-end speakers. They all had originally 5.1 and then to 7.1, their studio A. Uh, glass was our friend. We had beautiful gardens and a swimming pool. It was very luxurious. Uh, and it was also ear level monitoring. Uh, uh, um, Floyd Tool from Harmon came and helped us with the design and the acoustics. And the room was extremely accurate, Genelec monitors, and uh, we really, did a good job there. We did uh, Lord of the Rings, all the Blu-ray uh, remastering for uh, uh, for home theater, and uh, to name some things. I mean, was, you know, we were with top drawer pl pl uh, players and people there, but uh, we really sort of helped define what the home theater experience was and what our what I always uh, what I always liked about this, and I've shown this slide to many people, was that. I mean, besides the fact that it was literally called my home, Mikasa, okay, is that- it was, I lived upstairs. It, it, literally, okay, so the name spoke for itself. Um, the, the, the only better name I ever saw on a studio was Margarita, I thought that pretty much was the penultimate studio name. Um, but that's a whole nother, nother conversation. What, but what Bob identified was, was- Three typical rooms, three different but yeah. typical surround rooms. Ear level monitoring is something we were really very keen on as well at that time because uh, the, old, the original concept of monitors in the control room was over the control room window. So they were always up near the ceiling over the window. Causing but here, filters, yeah, there so was no, the studios were studios and mixing spaces and record. We actually did recordings in there as well. So it was a glassless studio, even at this, at this stage. But I always admired that it, that if you if you squinted your eyes and you kind of took the equipment out, I, I I go back in this one, even even to the point of using a, a home a residential style TV monitor up front. That was an era when people were putting in these big residential uh, TVs. Basically, um, the whole point was that it it didn't really look like a studio. It wasn't supposed to look like a studio. It was supposed to look like your living room because the DVDs ended up in your living room. I always admired that that aspect of yours. Um, it, it, it was really true to form, right down to the furniture. But don't be tricked. This thing was very accurate, this room. There was treatments above that ceiling cloud and behind these curtains. Um, the, the studios were tuned. The electric was 
was, uh, you know, fully integrated grounded system. It was pretty advanced. And um, it was way ahead of its time, I think, Bob. I really do. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it was uh, a marvelous experience. And we uh, made a lot of movies there. We made about 50 movies there before we, uh, we, uh, we moved on. But it was uh, definitely a fusion of a control room and a recording studio at the same time. So fast forward, in all rooms. Yeah. fast forward to where you've been for the last um, year or two. Obviously, the times have been very, very stressful and different. And I'm going to throw this one up and tell us what you did here. Well, this is out behind my cottage. I live in Hollywood, uh, just off of Vine Street. It's uh, a little bit like Blade Runner these days, but <laughs> nonetheless, uh, it's an old Hollywood college cottage from the 30s. And I had that garage, which you can see in the back there, uh, the before and somewhat after picture of what we did uh, to convert the garage into a both a recording studio and a mixing room. And Let's take a look uh, at it. There it is. This is what it looks like now. And uh, you can see the skylines on the ceiling and uh, pretty acoustically dealt with and damped and uh, three different flavor of monitors and uh, full Pro Tools and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ableton and all the various bells and whistles and uh, mixing and making records here. You know, I'm still making records after all these years, as they say. Bob, have you mixed? Have you done recording in this room and mixing? Absolutely, oh. recording and mixing. New album coming from uh, EP coming from my artist Animal Son. Uh, we're just buttoning that up now. I'm starting a new uh, mixing project in there with uh, uh, Robert LaSalle's new album, which has already been recorded. I'm going to be doing mixing with his co-producer, and we'll okay. be working in this room. Good. Well, thanks on that. Let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna yank the the hook for a few minutes just to make sure everybody gets their their five or ten minutes. Um, on a personal note, Bob, you you and I mean this sincerely. It it is amazing how you reinvent yourself. And I've only shared two or three stories here. There's there's five more that maybe we get the Robert Marinoff podcast at some point. But keep making music. Um, yeah, keep, you change our lives for, with the music. And get ready for immersive audio, you got you guys. Absolutely. It's really happening. Absolutely. All right, let's. Well, um, we're going to go to the other side of the world, eight time zones away. Pete, thanks again for staying up late. I hope your wife is. Thanks, a pleasure. Oh, me. <laughs> Pete, tell us about yourself. Tell us what's going on in in London right now. Uh, well, right now it's it's it's, uh, it's kind of weird, like the rest of the world, where we're kind of going back into a kind of a state of kind of closing things down. But um, the last three months have been really, really super busy. Um, so I don't know if you guys know much about me, but you know, Maloka are, are effectively a, a studio agency. So we represent 200 studios around the world, mainly in the UK. We own uh, around 15. Um, I was actually just joking earlier about, um, you know, the, the first bit of advice uh, someone gave me when I started back in, you know, the late 80s was, whatever you do, never invest in recording studios, because it's like the, the worst investment you'll ever make. And here I am uh, 30 years later with uh, 200 studios. Um, but, you know, never a dull day. I mean, I, I love recording studios, as you know, John, you know, we, we've worked together. And um, I think... Um, when you kind of asked me to sort of sort of sit on this panel and you were sort of uh, talking about, you know, what is a project studio? I guess I've always worked in project studios. You know, I, I kind of, when I started in the late eighties, studios were closing, you know, all the big, you know, Sony, Whitfield Street, uh, Mayfair, you know, all these kind of big commercial studios were all, were all closing. And I think that's when, where the sort of Maloko model started. It was when kind of studios were sort of, approached us and said, look, we, we can't fill our studio. Um, would you help us with the bookings? You know, would you help us with the maintenance? Will you help us kind of run the studio? And over that kind of the next 10 years, sort of more and more studios sort of joined, joined our group, if you like. And, and there were predominantly project studios owned by producers who maybe didn't want to use the studios all the time. Maybe they were working yeah. there six months of the year, but the other six months of the year, they, they came to us and said, look, will you, will you run them? Will you staff them? Will you insure them? You know, this is, this is uh, of course, Paul Epworth's model at the church and, and was Jimmy's model. Jimmy, yeah. but it wasn't, it, it was his manager's model. He recognized that 
that Jimmy would not be using the studio all the time. He'd be on the road, he'd be playing. Of course, nobody realized that three months after opening, he wouldn't even be here at all, but that's why it was, it, it was built to the specs that it was built. Um, yeah. I like this next slide because Pete sent me a, just a few pieces of eye candy just to give us, and I think that this, I'm not even quite sure what's on the other side of the studio. I don't even know if we have a picture of it, but. Yeah, it's quite, this is actually, I mean, this is actually very topical. Um, so in the UK, uh, there's a guy called, I can probably uh, say whose studio this is, uh, Gareth Malone. He's a, he's a, essentially a, a choir master, but he's become <laughs> like a UK, he's become a UK celebrity. So he brings together choirs um, and he did a, um, so over lockdown, he's done a really successful series whereby he's done remote choirs. He's, he really is the sort of, the nation's favorite. He's incredibly talented. Um, and we started looking at this project in I think December of last year. And he was arming and ahhing because, you know, he, he, he play, he's, a, he's a classical pianist. He writes all this material. This uh, studio is in his back garden in the middle of Crouch End. It's quite a, quite a well-to-do area. Um, if there was any, uh, if any of his uh, neighbours were uh, aware that he was going to be building, it, or someone was building a recording studio, there would. Did there. you say Crouch End? That's where the church is, right? It yeah. is. Yeah, exactly that. Place, so, same location, yeah. So you know, and this was an expensive studio. This was an expensive studio. This is a you know a concrete bunker. It really is absolutely. I mean, you know, we're getting sort of eighty dB from from this. It's there's sort of three sets of sliding doors, and and. Um, you know, he was worried about the cost of it, but you know, fair play to him, he decided to, to, to go with it. And it was finished in around March. And of course, then we got locked down. And um, he, you know, the, the sort of, uh, you know, the British uh, BBC basically broadcast a series, I hope it was the BBC, uh, from, from this shed. So, so it was probably the best investment he ever made. I, th I think it's almost only paid for itself in the, in the three months uh, that he was well, it's pretty, pretty consistent with that, with Bob's latest studio, studio yeah. escapade. I mean, look where that started, but here's a few other images that Pete sent us. And I, Pete and I, no, were I mean, this, just goes, I mean, this, this just, uh, you know, this is what I would describe as a project studio. These are basically just rooms. Um, and we talked earlier, John, about, you know, the, uh, the evolution of kind of panel systems and, uh, you know, being able to calculate a room, room acoustic and, buy it off the shelf, install it. You get pretty close to a, to a true sounding room. It's pretty basic kit. I mean, you know, th this a project like this, including all the kit was maybe 40,000 um, pounds. But these much. studios are being, you know, these, these are being rent, you know, this place will be rented 20 days of the month for three, 400 pounds a day. You know, really? studios have nev they've never made money. The studios have, and until now, and I think now they, they really can make money. If you create a, a beautiful space that has a great vibe. You don't have to spend a lot of money um, to be able to sort of, you know, actually make a good return. Uh, the picture on the left here, that's just like, uh, that's, a, that's a private facility, but it's for, um, it's for basically Atmos premix. So it's, it well, actually- I want to stay on the vibe thing because we, everybody, well, on this panel and maybe hopefully everybody listening knows knows where I stand on that position. I've been pretty vocal about it for years. <clears throat> um, but, in, but what Pete's saying, I, I want to second that 100%. I mean, in today's era, it's not hard to get good equipment. It, I mean, you still have to be smart about it, but it's not hard. It's not particularly expensive. No. Okay? And it shouldn't be that hard for you to get a reasonable sounding room. I think to go from an eight or a nine to a 10, I think there's still there's still moments of brilliance that, and, and, and some rooms are more difficult than others. But I maintain that, that and I know Bobby Margoloff will second this, and certainly I have to thank Jimmy 50 years ago, what's going to separate one room from another is vibe. That's exactly what's going to separate one room from another. And, and I mean, working in a room like this is fun. There's no reason why, why all our rooms shouldn't be cool and, be, and sound good and have great equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, Let's let, we got a few more that Pete sent me. This is a little more advanced on the lower left, right? This is, I guess, yeah. Atmos room. Well, that, you know, that, that's, yeah, that's like a pre-mix uh, Atmos room. Um, interesting, the top right image, that's an artist uh, studio. Um, nice. That, I mean, I, can, I, I, mean, I can't really tell you who it is, but I can tell you that there's been so many hits made in that, in that room. Uh, it was, again, probably the best investment they ever made. They've made 
three or four, you know, very successful albums in there. That they're writers and producers as well for other artists. It was a very sensible investment for them. And these are both actually home studios. Um, the one bottom left is just a songwriter. That's in his basement. Um, really basic isolation, basic fabric finish, uh, pretty basic gear. The top right, incidentally, is um, I probably am allowed to say um, he's a he's basically a film mixer um, called Peter Cobb, and he used to be chief engineer at uh, Abbey Road. And you know he he he's mixing uh, movie soundtracks in there. You know, again, it's he's got a it's a basic Atmos setup. Four, I think it's four or six ceiling speakers, but it's a. Well, those are not in, those are not inexpensive speakers, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, if, if if you actually kind of look at the outboard, that I mean that he's not spent thirty thousand pounds on his on his outboard no, in there. Not here. Um, no. I mean, that is for me that is the ultimate uh, home studio. Pete, are you are these studios that are being built mostly by producer users? Then are they renting them out, or are they just using them for themselves? What in London particularly? Um, about 50-50. I think, um, you know, Maloko is, I, I think, pretty uniquely placed in that we will, we will be approached to design and build and then manage and market. So, so it's sort of incumbent on us to build studios as well as we can because we need to sell them. Uh, and obviously our reputation is, is, is sort of key to that. So we will do everything. We, we offer a turnkey kind of uh, a service from designing to, to, to specifying the kit, to supplying the kit, to setting up the room, to staffing the rooms, to maintaining the rooms, to marketing and managing. So we kind of do a bit of everything, but ultimately just help people make good music. And that's, that's the most important thing to me. And I guess my last question is in, in this, well, you know what, we'll save the C19 conversation till the end, because I think everybody wants to chime in on that. Thanks, Pete. Um, let's, Let's go back to New York. <laughs> okay. Um, Clay has a, has a, 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 I think a slightly different story because you, you don't, didn't really, certainly Smash didn't really start as a recording studio, at least it, that's my knowledge of its history. It really is one of the two or three larger rehearsal studios in New York. Um, and why don't you maybe take us through a little bit about how you got started and where things have gone for you. Sounds good. Thanks, John. So, uh, you know, I started as a singer, played guitar, and I was playing in bands and had a little home studio, ironically, to what we're talking about. And I was producing our own music and uh, decided I'd open a studio in 1989 on 22nd Street. Uh, I got one floor and I built uh, five rehearsal studios and one very small recording studio similar to the, to the studios we've looked at from you guys already. Uh, then about six years later, I got it in my mind because we were doing very well in the recording studio. It was booked almost 24 hours a day. I built an SSL room on the floor above mine, uh, which was daunting to have rehearsal studios uh, below a recording studio and uh, booked that out to basically one producer for about six years. It was the Berman Brothers, and they did a lot of their hits in the 90s out of what was then called Gallery Studios at Smash Studios. And then in approximately, I can, I can say it was 2001, well, it was 20, no, it had to be 99. In 99, I moved to where we are now at 36th Street. And w when I moved, uh, I realized that to keep up with the, the Joneses and constantly be putting new gear in a recording studio was a losing battle. And uh, so what I did was I focused on rehearsal studios, but with a recording vibe. So all of my rehearsal studios, so I have two floors now because the studios you're looking at here, I, this, the studio on the bottom, if you go back one, John, this is gallery uh, with the SSL, um, the one after this, sorry, um, that one. So that's gallery that I, and I went from that to the next picture, 
or the previous picture. Okay, it, sorry, everybody. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, they're not exactly in the order we started. Uh, that's okay, fine. that's okay. We're, we're uh, studios. We're studio yeah. guys. We're not. We're not. We're not Shakespeare here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, basically, I've been in this space for 22 years. I have 23 studios, uh, ranging from very large showcase rooms that compete with an SIR. And yeah, very, I think this is one of them right here. Yeah, correct. That's showcase one on the bottom left there. This is a classic rehearsal studio. Yeah. But it's classic, but we have tie lines from this studio down to our control room. Ah, and okay. then we have uh, cameras that connect within this room with TVs to the control room and to the ISO boots on different floors. So these two rooms, these are rehearsal studios with back lines, tr traditional rehearsal business, are connected to control rooms. We'll get to that upper right one in a minute, to, to any of these rooms. Correct, correct. And everything, all the rooms are, booked, are, are built with uh, ISO recept receptacles going to an ISO transformer. They're all floated, all the rehearsal rooms. So when I built the rehearsal rooms, I built them like recording studios. Are you providing engineering? If someone wants to rehearse and then record using a remote room, are you providing the engineer? Do they bring the engineer? Do they know how to use the equipment? How are you, how are you handling that? Both. So we have, uh, usually if they bring their own engineer, we will have our engineer assist because of course it's pretty complex to go from floor to floor even just getting microphones from one place to another. Right. Um, so, but yes, we provide the engineers and in, in truth and what we've done, which I really think brings us into the here and now is we, in the last few years, we've gotten heavily involved with live streaming and shooting video. So what we're often doing now, especially during the pandemic and the closed, the shutdown is we are recording full bands in audio and doing three to five, five camera shoots with a feed to the live stream. Okay. And in that case, I've got basically three different engineers working. I've got one handling audio for the stage and then I've had one handling audio into the- You need someone on the stage. Yeah. You've I mean- got to have somebody in a control room, stage. yeah. Sort of, and then, and then somebody handling all the video and the switching. But you could not have envisioned this 10 years ago. You couldn't have thought that no. this was where you were. No, I didn't envision this far, but I knew there was a morphing of the studios. Right. And I, and I knew that the old style of having this giant board that cost X number of dollars to keep up every, every month and, you know, two Studer 827s, which was already becoming you know, out of date with Pro Tools. Well, even though I'm looking at a pretty big board right here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that was at the old space. Oh, okay. Right? okay sure. That's that's the old space on 22nd Street. Um, but I just, I gave you that because I wanted you to see yeah. how things have transformed for us and how I saw that we needed to change the model, at least in New York City. But Clay, talk to us about this upper right-hand photo. To me, that's as, in, as intriguing, if not more intriguing. I'm pretty sure I know what's going on here. Talk about this. So about a year and a half ago, I took over another floor below what we have now. So I have the 18th and the 17th floor. And on the 17th floor, I dedicated the whole floor to production studios. So I have uh, yearly rentals for producers that come in. I've got daily rentals. I've got a control room and a live room and I've got a podcast studio. This mm -hmm. is the podcast studio. And what I tried to do in this podcast studio was get it as plug and play as possible so that I could have one engineer come in and I have, what you don't see is I have Marshall broadcast cameras, very small, mounted on walls and one in the center. And we can do switching in the same room with, uh, with video and audio and set it up honestly within five to 10 minutes. Uh, so these can be these can work as podcast, audio podcasting, and vidcasting. Correct. And has that proved to be successful? Yeah, that that's been a big hit. That that's been a huge hit. In fact, so much so that we're starting to change other rooms yeah. into a okay. kind of a different style because we 
we were doing the Knicks uh, before the, the shutdown and they were bringing people over, but they wanted more of a couch feel. Mm -hmm. so we were setting up a room with a couch and then having okay. a, yet right. another video set up. Right. So this is a very, very different model and also different management style than the, than the hundreds of almost single person user studios that, that Pete's been, uh, been setting up. Not, although Pete, you do manage some comp, some larger complexes, but most of them are small, right Pete? I, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think most of our, most of the studios we manage are single studios. Yeah. Well, I'd say, you know, three, three people and upward kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, we do, we, we've got some massive studios, obviously we do orchestral stuff, but yeah, on the whole. Oh, and I, I mean, this is, you, you're mad, Clay, you're managing 20 rooms here. I mean, just checking equipment in and out is a, is a, is a nightmare. I, I yeah, would... it's, it's a huge endeavor. Just yeah. keeping on top of equipment going down is an endeavor. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah, we have, we have a, a, a 23 rooms. We wow. have uh, three big showcase rooms. We have a mid-level rehearsal room, which is, uh, but a nicer room with better right. equipment, a little bigger, uh, some windows built in for natural light. And then yep. we have smaller rooms for like the low budget stuff. Right, cool. Um, okay, well, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull a plug on that, but thank you very much for a quick tour of SMAD. Very interesting how you start in one place and everybody getting to the same place. It's interesting, but coming from different directions. Um, I, I, I wanted it. I think it's a good moment for Sam to jump in. I, I'm not actually Sam, you might surprise me. Maybe you do own a studio, but Sam, I know you as an editor and a writer, I pretty good friends with Howard Sherman, who's done publicity for our group for years. And um, what are your insights from what you're seeing? You're, you're in a unique situation because you, you get invited to write about a lot of things as to where all this is going. Well, I guess one thing we've seen from what's gone before in this discussion is there's no upper limit on what you can yep. consider a project studio. You can spend six figures, you can spend seven figures, and you can still have a project studio in the sense of a studio that realizes your individual vision of a space that you want to work in, and that suits you personally. We perhaps haven't had quite so much discussion of what happens at the other end of the scale. Is there a lower limit to what can be considered a project yeah. studio where it finally shades away into not being a studio at all or being something else, being a bedroom studio? Well, I guess Billie Eilish comes to mind, and, um, but looks like the lower limit is not very much, I guess. I don't know. That's an interesting conversation. Well, exactly. I mean, Billie Eilish, was, that album is one of the biggest albums of the last few years, was produced in her bedroom, um, probably on a budget of... Yeah, I don't, know if, it was master, I don't know if it was mastered in her bedroom. Well, you've got to understand that the computer, the laptop, has really become another folk instrument. Yeah. And really, the studio itself is uh, the only instrument that we actually occupy. Uh, we don't wear it or stand next to it or anything else. We actually live inside it but the studio itself is a musical instrument. And most of the technology really exists in a laptop now. It's changed the whole course of uh, how we make music. And I'm all for it, I'm loving it. That's not to say that there isn't room for a big studio, you know, if I need to cut six or seven people at the same time, I'll call up the village or East West and yeah. go over and use the big room when I need it. And uh, have the acoustic space and the microphone and the hot and cold running assistance and all of the things, the free food and everything else that goes along with a big studio. But at the end of the day, I end up in my garage at the end Sam, of the day. What do you, what do you <laughs> think about a lower limit? Is it, is there a lower limit? I mean, I you, think know, most studios, here, here, you know, this and this and this, I don't know, I guess that's a studio sort of. <laughs> it is. It is. And I think that, uh, Right now, one of the most important things I think is happening is the standardization of headphone uh, response curves. And I think one of the great people responsible for that is Dr. Sean Olive at Harmon, who spent the last seven years doing extensive surveys on how we hear on headphones. Because now, now music, you know, it's not just a, uh, it's not just a, uh, you know, a, a representation of a live event. The music actually unfolds in our heads and it exists primarily as vibrating. Let me, light. Um, let me present the question. Pete, have you, are you seeing 
have you have you been asked to do studios because you're building them? And and I want Sam to also answer this, where people are saying they're going to do all their mixing on headphones. Have you have you done a studio with no speakers? Uh, no, I haven't. I still think uh, I still think you know speakers are a. I mean, I've I've done you know as a mix engineer, I've done many projects where I've been mixing predominantly on the headphones because the room's acoustics have been has been so poor. Yeah. But it's still useful to be able to. You are you are that. a mixing engineer, right? Or you have been a mixing. Yeah, engineer. yeah. I mean, yeah. That's that's kind of how I started out. I I, yeah. I don't I think, think it's either or. I think it's both. I think you have to have a decent acoustical space because yeah. people work together to make music. It's not as always a solitary event. And they need a space to be interactive and to be creative in. I think that we live inside the studio. We live inside an instrument, but our real folk instrument is the light. And what are you what are you seeing as you write about this? Well, I certainly am seeing a lot of people who do their work predominantly on headphones, and it's not just really? the Billie Eilishes of this world. I mean, the mix engineers that we interview in our inside track feature, several of them have said, "I mix this track on headphones." And I guess thing. that's increasingly common in sort of genres like, I guess, trap and other hip hop genres. And yet at the same time, um, as Pete's shown, there's still a place for studios and people are still willing to pay money to hire studios to do big projects. And I, have so not sense, seen, I haven't seen a hip hop engineer want a studio and we've done a number of them. They, if you don't start off with a double Augsburger type system, they, they, they consider that the minimum requirement for their rooms. Um, so I guess, I guess everything's going to exist in the same world in some strange way. Well, I sort of wonder what, if what we're seeing in the world of Project Studio is actually a, a kind of diversification and that some of the conventions of studio design are breaking down a little bit. I mean, back in the day, a lot of those conventions were determined by the available technology. If you wanted a studio, you had to have a console, you had to have yeah. a multi-track recorder. Now, perhaps you don't have to have all that stuff. Yeah. And I think one good example of this is what's going to happen with audio over IP and Ethernet. Um, it's a brilliant solution for multi-room studios, for live sound, for educational institutions. Mm -hmm. Will it find a place in home studios? Will it find a place in small project studios? I don't know. Does it actually solve a problem that people who are running those studios need? Yeah. yeah very interesting. Um, well, you're not going to cut a string date in a home studio. You're going to go somewhere like Capitol or East West. No, you, you're but 30 men in the room, exactly. you know, it's socially distant spaces. But nonetheless, there is a truly a need for great. Let me, um, let me jump back to our last participant just to get the eye candy out of the way. PK Pandy, all these years, I well, I do actually know what PK stands for, but I can't pronounce it. Doesn't really matter. Um, a little bit about your history, where you've come from, because it's kind of interesting. And I, um, I, I, I'd like you to share with us your Mad Oak adventure, which is a studio okay. that you own, and your newest adventure, which I think is a very interesting notion of how lines are being blurred in this yeah. world. Anyway, I'll, right. I'll help you by queuing this there up. There we go. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, I'm a commercial rose grower. Went to school for that. Got out of it because the chemicals would uh, ended up killing me. I was always a musician, uh, not really familiar with studios, but uh, started working for a guitar center retail and then got sick of that. But they wanted me to stay to develop my own clientele. So I basically, like John said, invented GC Pro and did that for 15 years, built it to a $60 million division of guitar center. Got a little bored with that, wanted to expand my world a little bit. Uh, now on ABN Systems, so we do a lot of projects all over the world, kind of building studios, kind of what Pete's doing as well. Uh, we don't manage the studios, but uh, we get involved in outfitting them and getting them up and running. So Mad Oak was a, a great studio in Alston, Massachusetts, and we lost our lease, so we had 30 days to get out. Very fortunately, and some a lot of luck, we purchased this property down the street, which was owned by the Wallace family, Wallace Electric. And there's a two family uh, Victorian house in the front and there's this commercial building in the back. So we took this and transformed it over the course of three years uh, into something very interesting. <laughs> and maybe John has another picture of it. So that's now on the inside. We still have a garage door on the outside, but it's, it's now a glass garage door, pretty fancy and uh, built my dream tracking room 
you know, with the API console and all the outboard gear and all the, the lovely stuff. And I also manufacture the speakers. Uh, I work collaboratively with uh, George Augsburger. I'm actually the official horn maker for George. I make the horn. And uh, John has helped us tremendously with this, uh, WSDG, and it's become very, very successful. And so we have a very, very popular studio in Boston, Massachusetts. And one of the first things we did was not charge a high rate. So you can rent this world-class studio for $350 a day in the engineers. That's we try to do everything, everything a la carte, rather than being all inclusive, we said a la carte. If you want to engineer, you have to have an assistant. It's going to cost this much extra. But you do have all the equipment available to you and the vintage mic collection is there. So it's just a different vibe. We do mostly um, independent music, some pops, a little bit of R&B. Okay, this has been busy almost since day one, right? Almost since day one. We had a couple of months off since for the COVID. We adapted and it's now still very, very busy. Very busy. So we've been very fortunate. And I think the rate has a lot to do with it. We made it affordable for the musicians and artists in Boston, who we know very well. We're very well connected with the, with the quote unquote scene uh, and very interactive with that. So but that's why- an interesting um, experiment. PK is a, is a systems integrator, um, uh, has done a lot of projects for us uh, and other people, um, has a multi-city company, has done projects all over, actually in other countries, the Caribbean, uh, West Coast, Florida, New York, Boston. And this, this room, and this segues into the next slide, which I thought was a nice way to begin to end, because this room also has worked a little bit as a demo room on occasion. Yes. You've tested equipment here, tested, we've even tested treatments here. Um, yes. So it's kind of a lab, we, you know. A little bit of a lab, a little bit of a lab, yeah. Because I resell equipment, we get, we, and because I'm so involved in that, and I'm also an engineer as well, recording engineer, we get in there and we test the equipment. We have the accessibility to all the equipment, to everything you can imagine. We test it, and then we are able to give true opinions about the performance. Uh, so people, and people can come in here and listen to it in a world-class environment. You know, I basically built my dream room, WSDG design room uh, in Boston, and it became- Well, you know, it's Lori it. So, so I'll, PK decides that, He's going to spend half his time in Miami. By the way, that's not so uncommon. People who live in the north, it gets cold up in the north. So Miami is certainly an option. Um, tell us about this. this. This to me, as I listen to everybody's stories, and I've, I've heard all these stories before, of course. It's no accident that everybody's here. and How they've morphed into new directions. Yes. This one is the most interesting one. The name itself sets the tone here. I'll, I just threw this up to get the name, but I'll let this next slide, you can give the story on. What are you trying to do here at the Miami so we have a, Sound you, you, we, What I'm trying to do is create a destination spot for people to come and talk about audio, record, mix, listen to speakers, have uh, discussions, maybe have a cocktail, you know, I can give you some cocktail, enjoy yourself, spend some time, and also to continue the laboratory type of idea of testing equipment, which we've been starting to do. It's in construction right now. If I go 20 feet over, you'll see people banging nails and doing HVAC and electric right now. <laughs> it's pretty wild. The uh, rendering of what it's gonna look like, so. It's gonna look very, very similar to that, very, very similar. So sometimes so, it's a control room, sometimes it's a rehearsal room, sometimes it's a demonstration room. It's set up for multiple speakers. Um, it's also your tech shop. You also are supporting your, your installation business. Yeah, so we have a tech shop there where we can do all that stuff and also fix equipment when necessary so people can see that. And if I wanted to do drums, I could do it in the lounge area that you see there. Uh, I want to show people that how important the listening space is. And if you invest just a little bit of money, you can really improve your listening space. So that's why I'm calling that, instead of a control room, a listening room. Uh, so maybe it's crossing you know, the, the high-end uh, audiophile listening 
with, with all this. So it's multifunctional and you can clear it all out and have, you know, you know art gallery type of thing. Right, it could be a gallery one day, it could be a rehearsal room, you could rent it, you could give it to somebody. Um, events, event space, whatever. We have a very nice loft that we're building above. As you can see, this is very, uh, the vibe. We were talking about the vibe earlier and I'm going for this type of vibe, which is not basically your traditional Miami vibe maybe, but maybe there's a little bit incorporated in there. Uh, to support Symphonic Acoustics, which is my speaker company. Yeah. And, uh, That's the they, back area, yeah. Yeah, uh, WSDG did a great job of conceptualizing this, which is getting built right now. We're following this concept. And uh, I'm very excited about this. Uh, oh, and, and the other thing is that this is, this is happening in a, in a funky, it's, in a, it's an industrial park. I think that's really the coolest part of it. Um, what's the most important thing? Be able to pull your car up. Okay. We've got plenty of parking. We, yeah. Three doors down, we have Jimmy Douglas. <laughs> right, uh, literally three doors. He's there. already mixing songs. I mean, if I turn around, we're mixing some songs here. And we have Criteria Block Away. And yeah. interesting enough, some of my friends, artists, clients want to rent the room as a studio, but it's not really for rent that way. But they're asking just to rent the room because they know it's going to be a very interesting place. Um, so is this, is it a tech shop? Is it a lab? Is it a showroom for PK's speakers or anybody else's speakers? What, anybody else? Genelec has already asked to do some work here. Yeah, is it, so, so it's a space. Yeah. It's, but it's, you know, we're taking the time, obviously, to, to, for the design and the build to make the space, quote unquote, world class, in my words. And so we use the new piece of software that we've been developing. We're not going to have any time to talk about that. Um, the space kind of designed itself there really wasn't it, it's not a very big space i think pk's got options to it it's it's growing slow and organically but we used nairo software this is this iterative software program that we've been working on for over a year now to get the damping modules and in fact all the damping modules will be custom made specifically at the frequencies that we're interested in but that's a whole nother conversation and i'm hoping that our first demo of it is in fact in this room in fact it will be in this room yeah so that's that's it. Not only is it demonstrating equipment, it's also going to demonstrate our, our proof of concept acoustical software. But soon, more more to be revealed. Yeah. Um, and PK, the we're opening when 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 is this open? Do you think? Uh, we are. Let's say we're finishing all the infrastructure now. Uh, we'll start the shell in a week and a half. Give us two months to build the shell, and another month. So three months to do we'll the interior. Maybe by the by the New Year's. Maybe that's a yeah new. yeah. Be a nice way to bring in the year. Um, <clears throat> just some images, etc. I wanted to end with one piece of eye candy. Where, where's this going? People ask me all the time my favorite studio. That's a horrible question. Imagine, Pete, somebody asking you for your favorite client. That would just be terrible. Um, you'd have to answer 200 times. That would be awful. But I do have one that I kind of smile a little bit more, and that's this one. This is a, I, I, I um, it's an Airstream that we took the wheels off and polished and cherry picked it into the second floor of a building at the Lower East Side Girls Club. This is a 50 year old community organization where it's dedicated to teaching young ladies, teenagers and down, how to sculpt, art, dance, and also be audio recordists and radio announcers. And so inside this Airstream, um, again, using some interesting modeling and techniques, we made a very cool little radio station. Um, it's a, a, and, um, and, and, and a recording studio. Um, I think absolutely proving that they vibe is everything. As Bob said, we can, they can take almost any size and any shape. Um, as Sam has said, there's, there's no limit to the bottom or the top. I don't think there's ever been a limit to the top. Um, and um, we're, in, we're in for an exciting ride. That's for sure. I'm going to go out of my screen share and put us all on the screen for just a final hello to each other, or hopefully not a goodbye, but a hello. Great. Um, so we have a few more minutes before they're going to yank us off for sure. Um, I, I guess everybody, we, we, I don't think things would be complete at this AES without the C19 question. How, how are we doing? I'm, I'm not so much interested in how we're doing. I think everybody knows how we're doing or how people have been working. My question that I would like to pose to everybody is, 
what have we learned from the C-19 and what of, of the way we've learned to work, what's going to stick? Okay, what's going to stay and, and, and what's not going to stay? Sam, I got to give you the first insight on this one. I'm going to give you the first, first shot. Well, I guess what a lot of people might have been hoping would stick around is remote collaboration. And I'm not seeing that anyone has truly cracked that one yet because I mean, there are a lot of really clever solutions for doing yeah. it, but fundamentally the internet has latency and there's no way around that and no one solved that yet. So I think when COVID-19 is over, people will go back to wanting to be in the same room to make music. Got my vote. Um, Clay, because I know you have a lot of rooms, or you've come back, you, you, the, some of the rooms are being used. How I know New York has some very strict rules, right? Yeah, so our larger rooms are being used. Our smaller rooms are really tough to book right now. Yeah. Um, you know, along the lines of this, I think that after COVID-19, I have to agree with Sam and go along with the, what everyone else has been saying. It's all about the vibe, right? Well, you can't create that vibe with an indirect contact. You know, yeah. People have to be in the same room or, or at least near each other to be creative. Uh, I do think certain things will stick. I think that people will want, now that people have probably built a lot of their own, own home places, mm -hmm. they're going to do some of the work at home. Certainly, you know, recording projects you're going to send, and it's been done already. You know, mm -hmm. drum, you know, top drummers are doing the drums at home and then sending the tracks in, bass players, guitarists, etc. Yeah. But you can never replace the idea of a studio where people are around each other because the groove is just different. I agree. Pete, what do you all the, the I, I know you've been very busy. We, I, we, I talk to Pete frequently because we're on one or two projects together. What do you think is going to stick? These rooms aren't going away that you're making. That's for sure. No, I think, no, I think we'll see more and more of, of, of the kind of home or project studio, mm -hmm. of course. It's been quite interesting. I had a meeting today with, uh, I think I can probably say uh, his, his name, Alan Mulder, who for me is one of my heroes. He's one of the, you know, one of the best mix engineers certainly in the UK. Um, and, you know, he's been talking, you know, he's still got a big SSL, he's still got half a million pounds worth of outboard and monitors, you know, that's, that's his, his thing. But obviously, uh, you know, this has, this has forced him, if you like, to, to, to set up at home. Uh, he's got, a, you know, literally every plugin known to man, you know, he, he's, he's set up at home and he's been working at home for the last four months. And, and you know, I spoke to him today and he's, He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I'm getting great results. You know, I still like to go into the studio just to, just to check. But um, yeah, I think for uh, look, it's a, it's been a really difficult uh, six months for studios. But actually, I think uh, you know, it, it's, it's sort of pushed quite a lot of people to, to try and, and work in new ways. Um, we've kind of at Maloka, we've had this kind of uh, we've been some bits on social media whereby we're kind of saying you know music sounds better together because because it does you know you need to be together I, to I, I was uh, on the phone with Jack Antonoff I most of you know who he is who's can't be much more successful than him in the last year that's for sure and he's got a fantastic studio in Brooklyn it's it's a one room studio not unlike some of the, some of the slides you've seen he asked me not to show it um that, of course, when he had to hunker down, he stayed there. He also long-term leases a room at Electric Lady because he just likes, he doesn't really, he just likes going to Electric Lady and he likes to see people in the lobby. And finally, he said, that's enough. I, I need to go to a studio with four or five other musicians for a few weeks. So he's finding a destination studio. Actually, he's looking at one up in our neck of the woods. He, he just says, I, I got to be in a room of musicians. I've had enough of this for six months. And it was an interesting phone call. PK, what do you think? You're on the scene in Miami. I know yeah, yeah. you're going to have a problem of you're going to need four Miami. I, I predict you're going to need four MSLs before it's all done. I, we are already talking about doing another one. Yeah. Well, because people, are, you're gonna, first thing that's going to happen is someone's going to want to book the room for six months. You'll be out of business yeah. before you're in business. So what are you hearing? What do you think? Well, People are coming back together and just like Pete and uh, Sam and yeah. everybody else is talking about, they're realizing that they can be alone, but the key to life, one of the keys to life and uh, living yeah. a great life is your social re relationships with people, not so much social media relationships, but your real social network yeah. 
and your um, the community that you have. And their musicians are this way. And uh, my mixing friend engineers are you know, mixing on laptops now and doing much of it in the kitchen or wherever, but they still want to go down into the room and do the final test there. Yeah. So that's what I'm hoping will still go on is that yeah. you can do a lot of the work and adjustments and then go into the room just for your final. Yeah. And uh, because I, for me that it's a critical listening space, you get to hear mm -hmm. more. And I'm just hoping it goes that Bob, way. Bob, you get the last because you're the oldest <laughs> and, and I know you the longest. And um, I know you did a lot of work in the last few months. It's almost like C-19 didn't bother you. How, I think, uh, how I are think, you doing on this? What do you think? I think that C-19 certainly has been, had a lot of negative implications, but I also think that C-19 is driving our innovation forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's forcing us to confront a new kind of technology and a new way of making music. That's not to say that we shouldn't be making music together because music is the tribal ritual of our culture. People need to be together to make music. Uh, one of the most interesting things that happened is that uh, Zoom now has a high fidelity uh, yeah. channel, uh, which has been very useful. Uh, I have an artist who is uh, doing house music with my partner, and he would. She said, "You know, I really like when we're working together. When we uh, put the tracks up on Zoom, and I see the the Pro Tools file or the Ableton file zooming along." And I hear in high fidelity right off of the computer. And he says, the best thing I like is that I can see your face. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, normally when I'm in the studio, I sit on the couch in the back and I get to see the back of your head for six hours. I said, now, and then he said, well, now, it's like I'm right now. I just, I mean, the photos yeah. are nice and they're great, but I, I want to see, I want to see us yeah. right now. But it's good to also be able to look you directly in the face. Yeah. And uh, I think that that is an interesting observation on Zoom. And what we're doing now, for example, has uh, tied us together in many new ways. That doesn't necessarily mean that we are- Last, last, word, last word, anybody on this latency issue? Because I have heard, I mean, I was on the phone with Eddie Kramer. I've been on the phone with, with other engineers. Even Jack was working long distance with Taylor. It seems like they have solved the latency issue, Sam. I was curious to know why they, they see, it seems to not, be bothering a lot of people unless I'm not understanding how they called, work. Uh, it's a system called Audio Movers, which yeah, has, Audio Movers, right? That's the one I'm hearing. Seems to work. That is the same. It's it's close. It's it's as it's close, close as you can get with latency. But a lot of the stuff I do is in one direction. It's the client yeah. looking in on the studio and saying, "Oh, the kick drum isn't loud enough," or uh, "Move that eight bars down the or whatever. Have you, have, you, have, you, have, you, have you seen any 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 breakthroughs in that? And what? Just this latency issue, because I have heard that people. Well, the best of the best of it so far is uh, I, I'm in a group called the Lunch Bunch, which is all the okay. West Coast engineers get together once a week on Wednesdays. We used to go to the restaurant, but now we're online. But we discuss these issues, uh, engineering issues, and uh, uh, it seems that there's still going to always be some latency issues. Yeah. If the music's slow moving, that's fine. You can get away with it, but. If it's intricate and percussion and stuff. Or if you're working in one direction, in other words, if you're listening to something and you as yeah. a producer are simply saying, do this, that's. The other thing is that with uh, with uh, online recording, a lot of the artists I work with don't have a Neve module and a fancy mic in their living room to go ahead and do a vocal against the track that I have in the studio. So basically, it's basically a one, uh, one, uh, one way thing. It's like yes, one having the artist sitting on the couch behind you, except he sees your face. It's interesting. It's different. I think that music is, uh, uh, you know, it's changing the way we make music and the way we listen to music. I always have to say, who are the new cowboys and Indians? Who are the people that are really listening to what we're doing? It's not the guy from Poison or from Guns N' Roses with big hair and uh, jeans down and the tattoos all over the place. It's the people that are designing rocket ships for SpaceX and doing engineering, a highly educated people who are listening in their cubicles doing engineering. And uh, we're, uh, we're uh, uh, you know, making music for a new generation of listeners. It's not just always looking backwards. We got to look frontwards and figure out what people are listening to and why they listen to. Indeed. And who the cowboys and Indians are, who are we, who are we serenading and making? We're going to, there, 
there, Serge, thank you for clocking me out here. Actually, I, I think, I don't know what they're going to do, whether they're going to yank us for the last 15 minutes or not. But I, I told my boss, the, the, AA, the, the AES chair, I said, I'm, I'm, I, I work to get this group together for 45 minutes. Are you serious? I'm not even going to listen to that. So anyway, we could go another hour. Um, but on a personal thanks, thank you, Pete, for staying up late and Sam. Um, it's a pleasure. To any AES people who are listening to this, uh, when you listen to it, and I apologize, I'm not exactly sure when you're going to be listening to it. It's sometime in October, and I, I don't know whether you can ask questions live. I know I'll be on that session when they tell me when it is. But if that all fails, and you have a question for anybody who's been on this panel, you send it to me. My email is pretty easy to find, and I promise that I will get that question. I will. If you have a question for Pete or Sam, PK, Clay, or Bob, I will get it to them and I will make sure they answer it. Everybody on this panel is passionately dedicated to music and studios. It's about our only common thread. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna thank everybody. Um, Serge, I guess we can officially close the door on the, on the recording. You can even come back, Serge, and say hello. Thank you for doing this. All good, recording yep. is now officially off. <laughs>